Welcome online friends. My name is Joel and I serve on the staff here at Panama Baptist Church. So glad that you've taken the time to join us online. Thanks for being with us. I'm recording this in the middle of the week. And when I woke up this morning, there was a little dusting of snow on the ground. Not much, just a little bit of a dusting. It'll be gone uh, in a few hours, I'm sure. But man, I was not happy to see that. Now, maybe you were. Uh, my youngest son was really excited to see the snow. He enjoys getting out and playing in it. Maybe that's you too, but for me, I'm like, oh man, summer and fall, they just fly by too quickly, it seems like, when snow gets here. I guess winter is right around the corner. A few announcements for you as we start our time together. Theology 101, you've heard us mention that. It's coming up Monday, November 7th. It's in a couple weeks from now. It's going to meet about once a month on Monday nights. It starts at 6.30. Here at the church building, we'll provide a simple dinner for you, try to make your night a little bit easier. There's no cost, no need to sign up. You can just come Monday, November 7th at 6.30. Second thing I want to remind you of is the Trunk or Treat coming up on October 31st. So this is a great way for us to be involved in our community, and you can do that in a couple of different ways. Number one, decorate a car trunk and come. It's a great time of fellowship. We've got a lot of folks signed up already. It's a great way to meet some folks in the community. Let us know that you'd like to come do that. You can sign up on the bulletin board in the church lobby or send us an email, office at panamabaptist.org. The second way you can be involved is just donate some candy. Next time you're in Walmart or Wegmans, pick up a bag or two of candy that we could pass out to the kids in the community. We had about 250 people come through last year, so we could use a lot of candy for that. The Harvest Social is going to be November 19th, so mark your calendars. A little less than a month from now, November 19th here at the church building. There's always a talent show with that. If you'd like to participate in that, please sign up again on the bulletin board in the church lobby or office at PanamaBaptist.org. Okay, let me pray, and then we'll turn it over to the worship team for some music. God, we're thankful for your goodness, thankful for your, your grace and your mercy that is new every morning. God, I pray uh, for the people that are watching this, that they would be reminded of your presence and your love and your mercy towards them. God, gives us a good time of being renewed through song and through message from your word this morning. In your name we pray, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid Him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all We 
in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will
The evening of Jesus' arrest, nearly all the disciples fled. One of the two that didn't, Peter, a few hours later denied that he even personally knew Jesus. Uh, by Sunday morning, the movement was as dead as Jesus. The disciples were in hiding, but then things began to happen. Women went to the tomb to redo the burial, and when they got there, they found Jesus gone and angels who said that Jesus was alive. After hearing the report from the women, uh, Peter and John went to the tomb to verify what the women had said, and sure enough, Jesus wasn't at the tomb, although they didn't see him. Several hours later, Cleopas and another disciple had a life-altering conversation with the resurrected Christ, and they found the other disciples, and they were in the midst of telling their story when Jesus himself showed up, and this set off a chain reaction of belief and boldness. A few weeks later, Jesus was back in heaven, and the disciples were telling everyone about Jesus, about the resurrection, and about how to get right with God. And on one occasion, Peter and John healed a crippled man, and they claimed that the power to heal him came from Jesus. Well, shortly after that incident, the same religious leaders who had arrested Jesus arrested Peter and John. And we pick up the story in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Wow, Peter said a lot in that brief <laughs> testimony, didn't he? He said that this same Jesus, who you guys crucified, God raised from the dead. And this cripple, was made whole through Jesus. And Jesus is the foundation for all true belief and the only way to be saved and restored to God. The only way to God is through God. And Jesus is that way because Jesus is God. Peter said a lot. Well, that was hard for those guys to hear. That was definitely not what they wanted to hear. Jump back into the text, verse 15. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. That would be Jesus' name. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Yeah, these rulers wanted this story shut down for obvious reasons, right? <laughs> right? They were guilty of a crime against Jesus, and they were guilty of a cover-up, trying to cover up his resurrection. So they wanted this story shut down. They threatened Peter and John. Let's catch their reaction, Peter's reaction. Verse 19, Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. I love it. Peter and John said, look, God has told us to share this. So you can decide whether you think it's right for us to obey you or obey God. But we cannot. We are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Or put in other words, this is a must tell story. This is one of those stories that we cannot keep to ourselves Something absolutely remarkable, something life-altering, something absolutely amazing, something that everyone needs to hear has happened. And so we are going to tell what we have seen and what we have heard. This isn't something we've made up. This is something we saw, something we heard with our own eyes and our own ears, and it has changed everything, and we will continue to tell it because it is a must-tell story. 2,000 years later, and even though you and I didn't personally see Jesus die or see him resurrected, it is still a must-tell story. Jesus' sacrificial death and his resurrection is still the most pivotal event in all of human history. Jesus is still the only way to God. 
And Jesus still commissions his followers to tell the story, and he gives them the Holy Spirit to help them do it. We have a must-tell story that leads to a a question I just have to ask, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to clean it up. I'm going to just ask you very directly. We have a must-tell story. Can you tell it? Can you tell the story? Can you tell it in a way that works for you? In other words, can you tell it in a way that fits your wiring? I, for example, some of us are very self-conscious, and so for us, when we want to tell the story, it's really useful to have a, a diagram or something, or maybe a book or a diagram or, or something else that, so that it reduces the awkwardness for both you and the listener because they've got something to look at besides you. That's what I mean. Can you tell it in a way that works for you? But secondly, can you tell it in a way that works for this generation and for this culture? Friends, the questions that are being asked by this generation are different than the ones that were asked 20 years ago. The assumptions that are made and carried by this generation are different than those from 20 years ago. The needs are different from those uh, of people who lived 20 years ago. I mean, there's some of the needs that are still the same, but the other things that have changed. And so we, we want to adjust our starting point to the telling the story, to the needs to the questions, to the assumptions of the ones that we're, uh, that we're in conversation with, just like you saw demonstrated by Jesus and you saw demonstrated by Paul. He, he treated the, those who they found in the synagogues differently. He started with them at a different point in the story than he did when he spoke with those in Athens. I say that because a few of us, like me, have, have a favorite tool that we learned years ago, and, and it works well for us. That's great. Don't ditch that. But I would encourage you to add new tools to your toolbox, new ways of, of sharing the must-tell story. And there are lots and lots of tools available for sharing the must-tell story. Uh, I can point you to some. You can just you know find them on the Internet or find other ministry sites. And they have many of them have great tools, means, presentations, things that you can use for sharing the must-tell story. That leads to question two. We've got this must-tell story, and there are a tremendous number of resources out there for helping us tell it. Why is the must-tell story a rarely-tell story for so many of us? Why is the must-tell story a rarely-tell story for so many of us? Because surely Jesus expects us to tell it, and ministries have gone to great lengths to produce resources to help us tell it. So why are we not telling it more often than we are? My assumption, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but my assumption at this point is that most of us don't need me to take the remaining minutes of this particular Grace Bomb sermon to give you a how-to speech for telling the must-tell story. Uh, that's my assumption. Most of us, that's not where we're at. Most of us need help with the stage that comes before telling the must-tell story, and that's getting past the tyranny of our comfort zone. And I really think tyranny is the right word for it. I, I think that our comfort zones have so impressed on us that it is so dangerous and, and fearful and awful to get outside of our comfort zone and bad things happen when you're outside of your comfort zone and you just might not survive it. And so they threaten us. Our comfort zones threaten us and they keep us caged up and beaten down. And so I, I, that's where I'm going to guess that most of us are stuck. I, I think that if you aren't stuck here, if you, you're stuck with how do I tell the must-tell story? I can help you out with that, or we can, you, you can find resources on your own. But I think most of us, we're stuck here, getting past the tyranny of our comfort zone. And so what I want to do is take the next several minutes to just talk about two tools for getting past the tyranny of my comfort zone. Tool number one, grace bomb. Grace Bomb. Yet, yeah, one of the reasons I was so excited to introduce our church to Grace Bomb a, a year ago is this, because Grace Bomb is really good for the person who receives the Grace Bomb. I mean, there's nothing like when somebody, you know, does some amazing act of love for you and then hands you this card and says, you've been Grace Bombed. It's good for them. It, Grace Bomb is good for God's glory, God's kingdom, right? People find out about God. People realize that God loves them. They hear that story, so it's good for God. But 
grace bomb is just plain good for us. It's good for us because it helps us in some really practical ways. It helps us take baby steps into this whole thing. And the reason I think it works is because it lowers the risk of rejection substantially, right? There's a lot lower risk of of rejection when you're just doing something good to somebody and then handing them a card than there is if you wanted to launch into a full explanation of the gospel. And second, Grace Bomb is, is a lot easier for us because, at least for me, I don't have to say a lot. I do something, and then I say, hey, the card explains everything. Go to the website, right? And sometimes, sometimes with Grace Bomb, we can even get someone else to do half of it for us. I, I know of a couple guys in our church who've done exactly that. They've gone up to the counter in a restaurant to pay, and they said, I want to pay for the folks at that table over there, too. And so when you take in the check, would you give them this card for me? <laughs> they got someone else to help them out with the thing. Uh, they got someone else to do some of the talking for them. So Grace Bomb is, is a great tool for helping us push back against the tyranny of our comfort zone. Second tool is this, the four open prayer. I've adapted this from a three open prayer by Ron Hutchcraft. The four open prayer is is a prayer for God to open four specific things. The first thing that we're going to ask God to open if we're going to pray the four open prayer is this. God, would you please open a door? And when I use that term door, I'm talking about a natural opportunity to dialogue about God, about faith or life after death or hopes or dreams, regrets, Bible, church, those kinds of deeper topics. And so the first prayer is, God, please open a door. Give me a natural opportunity. I don't want to force my way into a situation, but if you open a door, God, wow, that would be great for me. I would like that. So God, please open a door. Number two, the second open is this, God, open their heart to consider truth. God, open the other person's heart to be willing to consider truth. That When they hear, if I happen to say something to them, if I plant a seed and I give them some truth, God, open their heart to consider it. We've talked about this before, the fact that the vast majority of people in our culture are not on a truth quest. They are on a happiness quest. And so anything that even has a, the, the scent of, well, that might, destroy some of my happiness, that might hinder my happiness, usually gets shelved immediately, right? And sometimes truth is going to be hard for our happiness in the short run. And so this prayer is a prayer in some part to combat that tendency. So God, would you please open their heart, give them a willingness to consider truth. Sometimes I phrase it this way, um, God, I need you to remove the binding and the blinding of Satan. Help them to be this person, to be able to see things for the way they really are. That's all in this second open. Open their heart to consider the truth. The third open. Open my ears and my eyes. God, open my, my ears and my eyes. And this is a prayer to the saying, in essence, God, as I get into a conversation with somebody, I want you to give me the supernatural ability to really understand what's being said to me. This is why we pray for ears and eyes. I want to be able to hear them well. Sometimes I don't listen really well. I heard a guy talk recently, actually Steve Cuss, and he said, you know, we listen for different purposes. Some of us listen not to learn anything, but we listen to defend ourselves. Some of us listen to to find a way to hijack the conversation and get it where we want it to be uh, or to say something we've always wanted to say. Some of us uh, listen to, to, for other purposes that are less noble. This prayer is, God, help me to listen really well, but then give me insight. Give me eyes to be able to see maybe body language or eyes to be able to see what's not being said or what's the baggage behind the comment that's made or whatever. God, would you give me supernatural ability to understand the other person when I am in dialogue with them? Fourth open. God, please open my mouth. At the right time, with just the right words, God, please open my mouth. And very specifically, When I say open my mouth, what I'm really wanting to pray to God is say, God, help me to say whatever it is that will help them to take the next step. Very rarely do we get in a conversation and we get to take somebody all the way around the bases, if you will. 
from like not knowing anything about Jesus to full faith in Jesus to crossing the line of faith. Very rarely does that happen. So open my mouth often is, is a prayer. To, God, will you help me to say whatever it is to help them take the next step? We help them to get to first base or help me, God, to say something to help them to get to second base or, or whatever it is. And that thing that we need to say might be a question. That's often the case. Yeah, I listen, and they're shouting, or not shouting, I hope they're not shouting. They're, they're, they're sharing some, some objections, some, some history, some reservations. And, and so it might be a question that I ask them that causes them to really stop, and they've got to really think about maybe a, an assumption that they have about God or something like that. So it might be a question, or it might be an invitation, an invitation to do one of three different things. It might be an invitation to keep the conversation going. Like, man, I really enjoyed chatting with you today. I don't know, maybe we could keep this up. Maybe we could meet again for coffee uh, in a couple days or whatever. So it might be an invitation to keep the conversation going. It might be an invitation into community or, or a study to investigate the truth. Like, man, I could see you're really thinking about this stuff. You should check out my small group. <laughs> or you should come to this group. I've, I've got a couple friends, and we're, we've been studying the Bible together. Or I... I've got this Bible study that takes people chronologically through the Bible so that they can just kind of make a decision for themselves. And I'd be happy to go through that with you. Would, would you. would you like to just do that over the coming weeks? An invitation to keep the study to, to, into a community or to investigate the faith. Or it might be an invitation into the kingdom. Like, yeah. And it sounds like God is really doing something in your heart. Is there anything holding you back? Because if not, I would love to help you get right with God today and, and get his forgiveness and his friendship and his leadership. It might be an invitation like that. That's the four open prayer. Open a door. Open their heart to consider truth. Open my ears, my eyes. Open my mouth. And the way we use the four open prayer is, is we just pray it. The beginning of the day, this is kind of like Grace Bomb, where you don't leave the house until you've, you know, you've loaded, you've grabbed your card, and you're ready to go. Well, the four open prayer is kind of like that. We, before we get out into the world and into our jobs and into our schools and our communities or whatever, we pray the four open prayer. We say, God, I just want you to know I'm listening, and I would love it today if you'd open a door and you'd open this person's heart to consider truth, whoever I get in a dialogue with, and then open my ears, my eyes to be able to understand what's really going on behind the scenes and what they're really saying to me. And then God, at the right time, with the right words, open my mouth. Grace bomb gives us practice in preparing and following God's prompting, right? Plus, it gives us practice in moving out of our comfort zone. The four open prayer gives us confidence to dialogue. Because when we see this natural opportunity happen, we connect the dots. We're like, wait, whoa, whoa. I prayed for an open door, and now I have an open door. Like, this person just started talking to me about faith, God, Bible, church, regrets, kids, <laughs> things like that. And so we assume, after we've connected the dots, we assume that if God did the work of opening the door, then God is at work now in the present, and he will work on answering the rest of our prayers. So the four open prayer gives us confidence. Like, okay, God, you've opened the door, so I guess I'll walk through it because I believe you are present here in this place right now. I trust you, so here we go. Uh, and, and I like, too, the four open prayer because it puts as much emphasis on listening as it does on speaking and knowing that all the right answers or having a perfect presentation. Those are two tools for helping us push past the tyranny of our comfort zone. So you're not the first group that I presented the four open prayer to several years ago when we were just starting planning a church there in Portugal. I was just painfully aware of the fact that it, this was going to have to be God, or it just wasn't going to happen. The, we were part of the second attempt to plant a church in that particular city. The, the first time they got a few couples together, and then it just imploded. And so we were there with attempt number two. And, and some of you have heard me talk a bit about the setting there, where it's just, you know, it's less than 1% evangelical in our city of... Uh, 18,000 people, the census reveals that under 100 people have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And the government, the, the, the chief political party in our county is the Communist Party, and there's a witch doctor uh, uh, in, our, in our city who is extremely influential, a warlock as well, and he just had a lot of power, and there were so many things going on. And I would go to God, and I would pray, and I'd say, God, you have got to plant a church here. You've got to plant a church here. If you don't plant a church here, then people are going to be, have some grounds to say it was too hard for God. It, God could do it in the city, you know, in Lisbon. He could do it where there were a lot of international folks. He could do it, you know, where there were immigrants and those kinds of things. But out here, it was just too tough of a nut to crack. And so I would go to God with great boldness and say, God, you've got to plant a church here. And so as we were just getting started planting the church, and we just had a handful of people, and I wanted to emphasize to them, look, the missionaries aren't here to plant this church for you. We're here to help you. We're here to pray for you. And we're here to set a good example, but we're not here to plant this church for you. One of the very first things that I taught this small group of believers, just this handful of people, was to pray the four open prayer. God, this week, give me an opportunity. God, when you give me the opportunity, I pray that the other person's heart will be open to consider truth. God, I pray that you would open my eyes and open my ears to be able to understand what's going on in the life of this other person and really understand what they're saying to me. And then, God, at the right time, open my mouth. And so I taught them to pray that. And, I, and we were just kind of gaining some ground with that. But I you know, was still kind of wondering, like, God, are you going to do this thing? Are you going to, are you going to make a, a church happen here are you going to come to the rescue of your name? And so one day, as Mara was participating with our city's symphonic band, they were having a parade through the city. And so I went to go watch her perform in the band. And, and I'm following the band along, and they went down right down Main Street. And then they turned to the left and went to kind of like the old center of the old city. And there's a, a little, like a town square in there. And when I got to this old part of town, there on the cobblestones was set up a temporary artistic display. Here's a picture of what it was. Four open doors. I almost started crying on the place because I, cannot, I can't completely describe to you what took place in my heart and my mind as I stood there listening to the band coming behind me but looking at these four sets of open doors. It was like God himself was just screaming at me like, I am here and I am at work here and you are on the right track and this four open prayer, this is more than a strategy. This is something I'm going to use and I am going to do a work here. I snapped several pictures with my cell phone, and those pictures have been used in, in that church plant ever since. It was just a huge confirmation. Interesting tidbit, that display was up for only a couple weeks, and, and the people I've talked to, none of them could even tell me why it was there or what it was there, and I've never seen anything like it there again. But it would be, it was so meaningful to me, and it was so, just a, such a testimony of God saying, I'm at work here. You're on the right track. Keep going. It would be comparable to if Chautauqua County decided one day, the, 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 the legislators said, do we want to do something to honor veterans? And so they thought through it. They planned it. And, and then I, I go to, and I hear that they put up a thing in Lakewood. And so I drive there to Lakewood to see what it is. And when I get out of my car, to my utter shock, this is their display. They have found a way. They have an aircraft carrier anchored in Chautauqua Lake. They'd be like, whoa, how did they do that? And it'd just be just mind-blowing because an aircraft carrier is the symbol uh, of the strategy that I believe God has given to us as a church. That, <laughs> that we, as, as, a, as a church, the building is the carrier, but the, the big stuff's not happening here. You come here to the building and you get equipped and you go off there and do what God has for you to do. Friends, whether an aircraft carrier appears or not, I'm confident of this. That Pastor Joel and I are in the lay hero business. Yeah, we're in the lay hero business. We are commissioned by God to inspire and equip you the unpaid Christians, right? You, you don't work for a ministry full-time. That's what I mean by lay. You, you do, and we are commissioned by God to inspire and equip you to be heroes in rescuing and discipling.
We are convinced that the most important battles for people's spiritual lives aren't taking place within the four walls of this building here. They're taking place in homes. They're taking place in your home. They're taking place at the places where you work. They're taking place in the clubs that, and, and the organizations that you belong to. They're taking place in, on the sports teams that you and, or your kids participate on or your grandkids participate on. They're, they're taking place at school. That's where the big battles for people's spiritual lives are, are taking place. And, and we believe that and are convinced that God intends for those battles to be fought and to be won by ordinary Jesus followers who are growing in faith and amazed by God's grace. I asked you a couple of very direct questions this week. I asked you, we have a must-tell story. Can you personally tell it? And can you tell it in a way that works for you and works for this particular culture, this time, this generation? I asked you the hard question of, if we have a must-tell story, we've got a commission from God and there are tons of resources available to help us with it, why is it a rarely tell story for so many of us? I asked you a couple of very direct questions this week, not because I want to get in your face, not because I invite you to church so I can beat up on you, but because I believe in you. I believe, I believe in the commission that God has given to you. I believe in the Holy Spirit that if you're a Jesus follower, he has put within you to do what God expects of you. And I want to do my part to inspire and equip you. I pray with all my heart that the time that we've spent together has inspired and equipped you for the sorties of this week. God bless, dear friends. So glad to be doing this with you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Andy, for this Grace Bomb Reloaded series. I know that I've been challenged and encouraged at the same time, uh, and I hope that you have been also. Let me close with our benediction verse uh, that you've heard for this series, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will prompt you through the Holy Spirit to do the good works that He has set out for you. I'm praying that we would be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and that we would be ready and willing when the time comes. Thanks for being with us this week. If we can be of any assistance, you just need somebody to talk to, or you've got some questions about things that you've heard, let us know. Feel free to give us a call, send us an email, reach out to us. Until next week, Panama Baptist Church, you are deployed.